Thank you very much. Um, it's a real uh, privilege to be at this meeting and to be here to talk to you today. Thank you, Lisa, very much for organizing it and for inviting me. And um, what I would like to talk about uh, with all of you is uh, how, our, how the clinical protocol sort of in its current um, version stands and, and I think give an introduction to what would be in, uh, involved in uh, becoming part of a gene therapy trial if it's something that you've thought about in your family. Um, and so the general outline of the talk will be that I'm going to give an overview of uh, the gene therapy trial. I'll talk a little bit as well about screening and uh, eligibility. Um, walk you through what would be involved <coughs> uh, in the actual schedule, sort of to go through the entire uh, schedule of the trial from beginning to end. Um, and then finally, I'll just spend a couple of minutes at the end talking about something that's separate but related, which is a, a natural history study um, for ADC deficiency, following on what Dr. Opladen talked about yesterday with the registry. Um, so I thought I would start by just um, asking the question, what is a clinical trial? Because I think we all have, we certainly hear the expression a lot. Um, you know, clinical trials happen all the time for the development of all sorts of drugs. Um, you know, the simple definition is that it's a research study uh, in which people volunteer to test whether a new treatment is safe and or effective. Um, and I want to unpack that a little bit because there's actually quite a lot of, I guess, implicit uh, concepts in that definition. Um, and so, you know, the first thing that strikes us is sort of the excitement of the opportunity. If you, you know, you have someone in your family, uh, or we as doctors treat uh, children with diseases for which current treatments really are not helping enough. Um, we are, you know, constantly on the lookout for new options and new discoveries that are going to be able to help our patients and our children and our siblings um, more. And so this is an opportunity to sort of move uh, our understanding forward and to create better treatments in the future. Um, at the same time, it might uh, feel a bit daunting, I think, uh, you know, unlike treatments that we normally um, discuss in the clinic where... They've been taken by many, many thousands of people before. You know, starting a new medication always in, in, involves a certain amount of uncertainty, but, you know, when, uh, how your child will respond to it. But, you know, we take the medication knowing that many people have taken it. We sort of have an idea of what the benefits could be. We have a fairly good idea about what the side effects could be. Um, and that's a little bit different in a clinical trial in the sense that many of those things are not known, and the trial is being conducted to help to, to uh, improve our understanding about all the benefits and the side effects. Um, and, you know, and finally, just the consideration of you know, safety and effectiveness or efficacy. Um, they're, they're related, but also really quite separate things. We, they're both important, obviously, they're both very important. Um, you know, in a, a typical development of a drug, for example, somebody starting a trial for a new blood pressure medication, you know, typically these assessments are kind of divided into stages so that, uh, first of all, a drug is tested to see if it's safe without really any regard to whether or not it's effective. Um, if it's shown to be safe, you then move on to other studies where you then test how effective it is. Um, and there are some reasons why that, there's some differences when we look at a study like the gene therapy trial in, the, in our patients in AADC deficiency, there's some differences about how we have to sort of balance and combine these two questions. Um, uh, because obviously this is, um, you know, a big endeavor. You've had a taste of what's involved in both the surgery and in, in the follow-up, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that. But it's a big endeavor. We know uh, it's a big decision to make to do it. Um, and uh, of course, absolutely paramount in, in our planning and our minds about this is the safety uh, first. Um, but uh, we are also conscious that, you know, in making the decision to go ahead, uh, there needs to be the potential for benefit and we need to look at what could be the benefit. And so trying to balance an approach that's safe with one that could also be effective um, gives us some differences. So. Um, 
this just some things I want to keep and want to, want to have in your mind as we proceed through the protocol because um, a lot of the elements of the protocol are really to address both of those questions. I mean, everything that happens in the trial is really with safety and uh, measuring effectiveness both uh, in mind. Uh, so as you heard from John and from Chris, uh, the initial sites for this trial are uh, UC San Francisco uh, and at the NIH, um, so on both coasts of the United States. Um, that's the new UC Sa San Francisco Children's Hospital, which is opening in February? February. It's, it's a brand new campus that's been built. Um, the NIH you've seen a picture of. And, uh, you know, plans are underway for the future addition also of a, a UK site, so that's at the stage of going through a lot of the regulatory steps right now. Um, the overview of, uh, I guess, the design of the study is that, uh, that, that has been approved by the FDA so far, um, is that our plan is to enroll 12 patients and um, roughly divided into sort of two phases. In the first, um, really safety is the principal aim uh, to determine a dose that's safe. Um, there will be an initial cohort of three patients who receive um, the first dose, uh, uh, which is a, a low dose of the medication, of the vector, um, with at least three months in between so that we have a very good opportunity to follow the patient uh, for several months after surgery and uh, get a good understanding of, of how safe the procedure is. Uh, if it is determined to be safe, then we would go on to a second group of three patients whose dose would depend on how the first cohort responded, meaning what were the side effects encountered, uh, if any, um, how did the patients respond, and there will be different evaluations to, to judge how successful the gene transfer was, um, and then those elements will be used to decide the appropriate dose for the next group. And then, um, you know, a third, uh, a se or sorry, a second, I guess, review of how those patients went will then, uh, if successful, we would move on to, you know, a further six patients at the maximum dose that was determined to be uh, safe. And so the first step in the process sort of for an individual or family um, is uh, sort of the pre-screening pre stage um, where once we have IRB approval uh, from the institutions who are going to be carrying out the study that we would uh, provide in much more detailed information about, you know, exactly what will be involved. Um, and this period is really a time for exchanging information. So it's for, for families to learn about the trial and, uh, in, and all the details involved. Um, I guess this is the first step in that process today, but uh, there will be many more details that people will obviously want to know. Um, and then the study team also then needs to get to know uh, the child. So there would be a, a, a process of submitting clinical information about your child, including their diagnostic test results, um, clinical information from their doctors and from previous hospital stays, um, brain MRI images if, um, it, you know, if we could get those available as well. And I'm going to present here just a, a sort of an overview of the eligibility criteria. They're, they're not yet completely set in stone, although they are fairly set. Um, and the first one is that you must have a confirmed diagnosis of ADC deficiency, which I know sounds like really stating the obvious, but, uh, you know, we definitely want to be giving this treatment to people who, uh, who can benefit from it. Uh, so we would review CSF, uh, genetic, and um, enzyme uh, analysis test results. For the first three patients, the age that's uh, the age range is five to eighteen years. Um, the, the five years I've put as a star, uh, we're a little asterisk next to it because uh, the reason for that being the minimum age uh, initially is is a surgical safety concern. Um, you heard from John and from Chris that the uh, surgical system involves uh, fixing the head in in a frame and that frame involves pins to hold the, the head in place. And five years is currently the age at which we feel confident that the skull is mature enough to, um, to have that fixation system attached to it. It's, pos it's possible that in, uh, in the sh near term future that age would reduce, but certainly for the first few patients we want a minimum age of five. Um, 
second general principle is that, that uh, the child will have tried currently available therapies for ADC deficiency and not have had adequate benefit from them. Um, you know, as we've discovered from yesterday's sessions, there is perhaps an increasingly large spectrum and range of severity that we've become aware of. Uh, some patients do respond quite markedly to treatment, whereas many have, you know, little or no response. Um, and so we've considered important that children have tried currently available medicines and that we know that the, the, the initial children who are enrolled in this trial um, have tried medicines and, and not had a good response to them. Um, the, another criteria would be that a that child should, uh, that we're, we would be enrolling children who are not able to walk on their own. That means either on their own or with a, um, with a walker or some other assistive device. And then there will be a number of just details in the medical history that need to be carefully reviewed, you know, primarily from a safety perspective to ensure that the child um, doesn't have other medical problems uh, that would pose a, an, you know, an unacceptable risk for surgery. And, uh, you know, a question many of you might be wondering about is what about medications? You know, my child already takes a number of medications. Are we still allowed to take those if we do this study? Um, the general uh, principle we have is that people would stay on their medications. Uh, so we're not requiring that everybody suddenly take all their medications off, uh, you know, leading up to this. Certainly at the time of an initial inquiry or um, applying at the pre-screening stage, we would say people should stay on the medications that, that they're on. Um, there are no definite requirements or restrictions regarding medications. I've put a little asterisk because I'm going to come back to that in a few slides. But um, uh, you know, at the time of the pre-screening and screening evaluations, if there are any medications that would be, an, would be an issue for some of the assessments. And I'm just going to say for some examples, um, some patients might be on an, an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which would interfere with a DAT scan. Uh, and so if that's the case, then you know, the appropriate advice would be given about how long the, uh, before the scan the medication would need to be tapered off. We're talking days or weeks, it's not months. Um, some patients may be on levodopa. Um, and likewise, there's no need to rush to take any, any medicine away, you know, months in advance. If a patient is on levodopa at the time that we initially um, l start learning about them, then we would make a plan together with the family and the, f and the child's doctor. Um, it would probably need to be tapered off before the baseline just because it would make the interpretation of the uh, spinal fluid results in the trial a little bit challenging. And... So for an individual person, uh, what I'd like to do now is <coughs> just walk you through kind of what, what it would feel like or what it would be like to go through the different stages of the trial. Um, so let's assume we get to the point where uh, after all the pre-screening, um, the study team has re reviewed the records and feels like this is that the criteria have been met and, and the next stage would then be to ask families to come for an in-person screening visit. Um, and at that point, um, there would be a couple of additional uh, requirements to confirm things. We saw in, in Dr. Bankovic's talk, um, a DAT scan showing that the projection f from the substantia nigra in the midbrain to the striatum uh, looks like it's intact in children with AADC deficiency. Uh, we do want to confirm that that is the case in individual patients, given the surgical approach that's being taken <coughs> is to deliver the gene vector into the midbrain under the assumption that it's then going to be transported up. So we want to make sure that um, an individual child has the appropriate circuitry that we can see uh, to, to have the potential to respond to the therapy. Um, if your child hasn't had an MRI scan with, within the last few years, then we would uh, repeat an MRI scan at that time. Um, and then at the end of all that, we would you know, the team would review the information, sit down with you, and have a discussion about um, whether or not the child is eligible. Um, and then if, you, if somebody actually enters the trial, um, then um, there'll be a, a surgical phase, the second phase of actually coming and having the procedure done and being monitored. And then 
a much longer phase where the child is still in the study but at home and uh, coming for follow-up visits. And the time uh, for all of that from the time of the surgery is, is two years. So let me go on to just describe um, the screening visit, which I've touched on a little bit, but uh, in a little bit, maybe a little bit more detail. Um, you saw this picture earlier of the children's in at the NIH. So the screening visit would be the first time that uh, you know the family would travel to actually uh, meet people involved at the site, um, and the people that you might encounter uh, on your visits to the site um, would include a team of people. You wouldn't necessarily see every one of these people every time, but you would, over the course of the study, certainly see all of them. Um, there would be a, a neurologist who's at, who is at the site, uh, the neurosurgeon, of course, uh, an anesthesiologist who would also meet, meet the family at the first visit, um, a nurse with the study, a study coordinator, uh, and then other people who will, who will be involved in the assessments, like a physical therapist, a neuropsychologist, and, and a social worker who would also assist us in, in coordinating um, various aspects of, of the trial. So at the screening visit, um, there will be medical evaluations, so by several doctors, a neurologist, the anesthesia doctor, there would be some blood tests, um, informed con consent um, would also be, I guess, formalized at this visit, uh, although it's not the first time you would hear about it. I mean, for families, really informed consent is uh, not sit down for 10 minutes and sign a big form. It's really, um, you know, it's a process, and it involves exchanging of information so that you, people feel like they have time, they have time to answer all their questions, uh, have all their questions answered, uh, and that would really start, you know, probably a couple of months before this visit, but the actual uh, formal, formal part of it would happen at this visit before we, we went ahead with any procedures or any, um, any actual events in the study. Um, the necessary scans would be done to help us make the final determination about eligibility. And then if at the end of all of that, uh, the sense that the child um, uh, would be eligible, then our plan would be for scheduling of surgery within about two months. And so then I guess we get to the, 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 the sort of intensive part of, uh, of this whole trial, which is the, the period that um, would be spent actually at the study site um, for surgery and for post-surgical monitoring. Um, there would be a, a baseline evaluation at that time. So uh, in the week before the surgery actually happens, uh, where we would do a neurological exam, we would want to do uh, assessments of uh, children's motor, motor function, their developmental function. Um, we also would want to have a good uh, idea of what their symptoms are at baseline, and so actually before this visit, um, parent, families would be um, instructed a, a, and on how to complete a symptom diary so we can get a picture of sort of a typical week in your child's life and have a good idea of what their, their symptoms are like. Uh, and then also questionnaires that are to do more with um, daily functioning and um, quality of life uh, for the family. Then in blue on the other side, there would also be some procedures. And the procedures are um, an F-DOPA PET scan uh, and also a lumbar puncture, which uh, would likely be combined actually with the surgery itself, in other words, not an extra procedure for, with anesthesia that the child would need to have, but it would be uh, most likely combined with surgery so that it was done uh, to minimize the number of times the child has to be sedated for these tests. Um, and the purpose of those evaluations are those are very important ones that will help us to understand after the gene transfer what the effect of the gene transfer has been, in that we expect um, signal on the PET scan to change. If AADC becomes active in the brain, we should see uh, F-DOPA PET signal change on scans. Um, we should also see a change in the CSF metabolites that are, you know, instrumental to how the diagnosis was made in, in the first place in, uh, in your children. And then the hospitalization itself uh, would be planned as hospital admission either on the day of surgery or the night before. This would be a, 
um, a decision perhaps made based on a lot of the children, uh, the children's particular medical issues. For example, if a child really doesn't tolerate fasting, and we feel like they would be more safely, uh, you know, uh, prepared for surgery by being in the hospital, say with an IV, so that they don't get low blood sugar, that might be decided upon. Um, but we can, that would be somewhat individualized. Um, then the surgery itself would happen, which, as John said, would take the better part of the day. Um, our plan is that then there would be probably a two to three day stay in uh, an ICU setting to very, very closely monitor uh, the child postoperatively. Um, you know, the child would actually stay in the ICU setting for as long as they need to to be stable to be discharged. You know, if things go smoothly, we, we anticipate that to be a 48 to 72 hours. Um, and the total hospital stay we estimate to be seven to 10 days, but obviously would be, you know, very individually dependent on on how, um, how things are going. And then um, there will be a period where um, we want people to remain at the site, not in a hospital bed for that whole time, but where we would like them to stay um, nearby, so at the Children's Inn at the NIH or in equivalent housing if it were at UCSF. Uh, and you know, why does this period need to be so long? Because I, I fully appreciate that the prospect of having to you know, leave home for that period of time is no small task. Um, but we think there's an important reason why we need to be prepared to do this. Uh, you know, we expect that after the ADC, ADC gene transfer, um, you know, the body will start to make ADC potentially at around one month afterwards. Um, which means that the body will also start to make neurotransmitters in levels that have not been what the child has been used to experiencing, you know, in their life up to that time. Um, and there will be anticipated changes in their movements, perhaps in their behavior, um, which will need to be really closely monitored um, at that time. One of, those, one of those things that we anticipate may happen is, is dyskinesias. Um, we heard a talk from um, Rosa Pons yesterday about dyskinesias in, uh, following levodopa treatment in tyrosine hydroxylase deficiency. Um, many of you may have experienced this, uh, you know, just in response to medications with your own, uh, with your own children. Um, and um, as Rosa said yesterday, they're caused by, uh, as we understand it, the brain being hypersensitive to dopamine in the setting of having a chronic dopamine deficiency. Um, and the very crude analogy I sometimes use to describe it to patients on a totally different time scale is sort of what happens to us when we spend a long time in a dark room. You know, you walk into a pitch dark black room, you can't really see anything. Uh, your eyes adjust, uh, you know, the more sensitive uh, cells in your eyes adjust to that darkness. If you're there for a long time and then you walk straight out into bright sunlight, you know, for a few seconds or minutes, it's overwhelming. Um, you know, on a very different time scale, um, a similar thing might happen when suddenly levels of dopamine in the brain are much higher than they, than they were to begin with, and the brain is used to operating at a sensitivity that's much, much different. Um, if that happens, um, you know, we will have laid out in our protocol what to do in that setting. Um, it might involve the withdrawal of certain medications that your child has been taking before. Um, it might involve the addition of some other medications which are specifically to con help control involuntary movements. Um, and this is something that's, you know, difficult to predict how severe and how prolonged this will be. Our, our expectation is that if they occur, um, it is something that would improve over time, um, but we have to, I think, be prepared for you know a, a range of possibilities and have a plan of how to manage them. Um, and you know that maybe leads to the next question, which is: that there is there anything that could be done in advance to try to prevent that? And I think the really honest answer is I don't know, and I don't uh, know that we can really establish a, a firm answer to that question. I would invite thoughts from any of my colleagues here about this. Um, you know, one of them, uh, one of those ideas is, would treatment with a dopamine agonist beforehand have a chance of reducing the post-surgical dys dyskinesias, meaning does the dopamine agonist reverse a little bit of that hypersensitivity? 
Um, you know, a dopamine agonist is much less potent than dopamine, so exactly how much that could uh, happen is, um, I think, very difficult to predict, but it's something I, it's not yet uh, a requirement, firmly established as a requirement that patients need to be on a dopamine agonist beforehand. It's something that uh, we are still sort of finalizing as the whole advisory group that's putting this trial together, and it would be information that we would give you sort of well in advance if if it turned out to be something that was important. Um, I should say during this two to three month period, um, you know, with the first few patients, we will really have to, I think, make judgments about how things are going as they're happening. Um, one scenario is that the patient would really be monitored there for the full three months if there's a lot of adjustment in medication that needs to take place. Um, and with, we plan, though, for all, all patients that at three months there would be um, another sort of assessment point similar to the baseline, repeating some of the tests that were done at baseline to get an early understanding of what the effect of the gene transfer was. So can we see, for example, that there are now changes in the CSF markers? Can we see changes in the PET scan? Uh, and it would give us some early clues as to how effective the gene transfer was. Um, <clears throat> And at that point, if all has gone well, people would be ready to go home. Um, and um, so what we would plan is that we would certainly discuss, you know, with your child's doctor at home um, everything that's happened so that they have a good understanding of their, uh, where they're at. Um, and then once home, we anticipate there, was, there will be ongoing contact sort of between the family, the, your primary doctor and the study team. Uh, if there are questions, if there are, you know, observations that arise that, that we need to know about. And then we come finally to this third and I guess the longest part of all of, uh, longest part of the trial, which is um, the period from three months to two years where um, we anticipate people will be back at home but coming for uh, periodic follow-up visits so that we can very closely monitor what's happening. Um, they'll roughly six monthly, so at six, 12, and 18 months, we would um, uh, anticipate that um, families would come back to the center for a two to three day visit where there would be clinical assessments mainly, so visit with a doctor, with a physical therapist, many of the questionnaires that were done at the beginning. Um, and then uh, at the 12 month visit only, we would repeat a lumbar puncture so that we could uh, assess the neurotransmitter levels. Um, and then at the 24-month period, which is really the end of this um, formal stage of the study, uh, a slightly longer visit where we would do all those clinical assessments and then in addition do a final FDOPA PET scan to, to assess the, uh, the stability of the changes. And so... Um, after that, we would also anticipate, obviously, this is, you know, a therapy that it's expected to be lifelong um, and that we may continue to see evolving changes, hopefully positive ones, uh, you know, over years afterwards. Uh, so we would also plan, um, and the FDA thinks is important, you know, a long-term long follow-up study, which would be uh, annual visits. Um, with clinical <coughs> assessments only, not the procedures and the scans and so on, but basically annual visits um, to, to know just how things are progressing and, and what symptoms a child is experiencing over time. So that kind of brings me to the end of the protocol. Um, I guess I want to end by just saying that this is, um, as I said at the beginning, an exciting and a daunting prospect both. Uh, you know, it's really the beginning of a journey towards what, what uh, we hope will be ultimately bringing um, new therapeutic option uh, to patients with AADC deficiency that's going to really have the chance to improve uh, their function and, and their lives. Um, it really is, and this really is a partnership. I mean, as much as uh, you know, I'm here to give some information today, but um, you know, I think I learn more from families sometimes than what I can tell them. I think that's not, that's not an understatement. That's always true. Uh, and your input is also very uh, valuable to us as we are kind of entering this final phase of, um, of, of getting all, all of our, 
all of our plans set so that we uh, make this as successful as possible. So I want to end by just um, inviting you to uh, write. You can certainly come and talk to me in person, but I'm also going to invite you to write down um, some responses to a couple of questions. One um, would be, uh, and you don't have to take notes, there are actually there are those papers that you can fill in, <laughs> just throw those. Uh, what problems you find most challenging? This could be day-to-day -day life problems, this could be concerns about the long term, but uh, things that are on your mind about the most, you know, your challenges of, uh, of AADC deficiency. Um, a second question, you know, thinking ahead a little bit, what, what improvements, and not, not necessarily huge ones, I mean, what improvements, even small improvements, um, would make meaningful differences to your everyday life? I mean, you know, I think all of us, if we had it within our capacity to do so, would like to have something that could just, you know, erase all the symptoms of this condition and many others like it. But, you know, short of being able to do that, there are often many, many things that make a huge difference to families' everyday lives, which, um, which I would also just invite you to think about. And if you'd be happy to share them, they would also be extremely helpful to us. Um, so there's a sheet of paper at the end, next to the flower arrangement on this table. Take your time to fill it in. You do not have to write your name on it. Uh, if it, These are just uh, kind of confidential comments, if you like. Um, and I will make a plan about how to best collect them. I don't want to just say give them to Lisa, because I feel like Lisa has a lot to do already. Uh, <laughs> but uh, well, that's fine. So either hand them to Lisa sometime before, <laughs> sometime before the end of the day, um, or even tomorrow morning. And I'll make sure that uh, I look at them carefully. Um, and then just before I finish and we all have lunch, uh, I want to talk really briefly about um, a natural history study. And, and Thomas Opladen talked about this yesterday. It's very, very valuable work that the INTD is doing to create a registry for, for ADC deficiency and for all neurotransmitter diseases. And, um, you know, fulfills a really important, um, a really important um, role in being able to to enroll patients in a registry and follow how they're going uh, over time. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I, I really didn't mention at the beginning, although it may, uh, may be a question that some of you have, uh, in this study there's no placebo. You know, we are not uh, doing fake surgeries on anybody. It's not a placebo study like, you know, some drug studies are. Uh, you know, everybody who comes into the trial would get, get exactly what was described. Um, but an important question comes up in, a, in trials like this of you know, how to judge its effectiveness, and that involves having a really as good an understanding as possible about the spectrum of the, d of the disease, um, what the outcome is, what are the range of medical problems that, that children face. Um, and so our goal in a natural history study, a retrospective one, meaning to sort of collect information that we currently have um, to, to understand you know, the symptoms, the clinical course, and the outcome of patients with AADC deficiency. And this is something that we will, um, will aim to do uh, in the next six months, and it will be in the form of a questionnaire to both families and doctors, uh, and I will um, collaborate with many of the doctors in the room on this. Um, it's really separate from the gene therapy trial, so it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's important to the gene therapy trial, but it's really not... Um, specifically part of the gene therapy trial. It's something where we want as many patients to, to provide information as possible. Um, it's anonymous. It, it's really not, nothing to do with screening for the trial. It's, um, it's just to try and obtain you know, the best information we can about the disease uh, so that we really make sure that we make the best possible plan going forwards. Um, so I want to say thank you uh, to the Pediatric Neurotransmitter Disease Association who has funded the trial, specifically have also uh, supported me through my work in this trial, um, and Lisa and the AADC Research Trust also for their support and for hosting this terrific meeting. Um, I look forward to talking with all of you more this afternoon, and um, I guess that's a good place for me to stop. Yeah? Okay. <laughs>